Thank you. Yeah, this session will be recorded. So our agenda today, uh, we'll have some definition of uh, what are community assessment, what are some methods of community assessment, and some approaches to community assessment. Uh, and Brian Butler also will talk about secondary data collection and examples of, uh, from the field and sources of secondary data. So, um, I mean, this, this project cycle or uh, program life cycle, must be familiar to many of you, or if not everyone here. Um, if we were to establish a program or a project, we always start with our problem identification. We want to know what's happening in the community that we're, uh, we're, we're, we're targeting or the population that we're targeting. Then uh, we identify the issue, the problem, the concern, the need, uh, and then we move on to formulating that project. We implement the project, then we go to monitoring evaluation and then the cycle goes on. Either we feed back into that project to improve it or we modify the project or we start a new project and so on. Um, so what, what is the need? When we say needs assessment, um, we'll talk a little bit that how I'm interchangeably using needs assessment and community assessment. I'll explain in a little bit, but um, what, what's the need? Uh, the need is, your current status, and then you compare it to the desired status. So that gap in between what you have currently and what you look for to, or what you are, what you need, where you need to get to, that's, that's your need, that's, that's the gap here. And uh, I'll give an example. For example, you're, uh, you have a community where you have, um, let's say teen, uh, teen pregnancy problem. That's not the need, that's the problem itself. That's the problem identification. But the need will be what kind of programs you need to do there, then that's, that's your need. You need uh, maybe uh, awareness programs, you need uh, more access to contraception, so on and so this is your need. Um, so in the chat box, if you are working in communities, um, what are, some ideas, why do you think it's important to conduct needs assessment? I'm sorry. determine where to direct limited resources, put efforts in community, know what's truly needed, target program, meaningful program, yes, and meet our target audience where they are, exactly. So I have great ideas and you all shared great ideas here in the chat box. Uh, you pretty much share, um, maybe a little bit more than what I have in my slides, so we're fine. So we gather all available information, understand problems, identify gap in extension services, and then identify future extension programs. These are some of, of, of the reasons why we conduct needs assessment. So what are the some methods of collecting uh, needs assessment? And I have to say that uh, tomorrow's session with uh, uh, Debbie and, 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 and Teresa, they will cover in details some of these sessions. Here, I'm just introducing some of them, uh, the, the methods of data collection. Uh, some of these methods are uh, discussion groups, and I didn't say focus group discussion. Discussion groups can be a little bit, um, I have a method that I'll explain later, but any type of discussion that's not very formal discussion can be a discussion group, but focus group interviews or focus group discussions are more, they have certain criteria, and I think Debbie will cover that, uh, Debbie and Teresa will cover that tomorrow, but some of the criteria you have a number, a specific number of groups, a specific topic, uh, you ask one question, etc. A nominal group technique, it's another method where you, uh, you generate information in a short period of time. 
Uh, you can also conduct data through interview with key stakeholders or key informant interviews. Um, again, uh, it's um, most of the time semi-structured. You have your questions, you, have, you ask probing questions based on how the discussion takes you. Uh, you also can uh, conduct surveys. Uh, and other methods. Other methods could be observation, for example, that's another method. Um, and if we notice all this information, uh, all the, let's say the first four in my list here, before we go to survey, it's mainly open-ended questions. And these open-ended questions gets you to um, text. It's not data, it's not, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's data, but it's not numerical data to be specific, uh, it's text. Again, on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday, I'll be talking about how to analyze qualitative data. We call it qualitative data. When you get to survey, then survey you can have uh, either uh, heavily quantitative or qualitative. Uh, do I have a question? Yeah, a lot of words, um, as Debbie said. Uh, with, uh, with qualitative data. So I'll take you through on Wednesday how to make sense of all this data. Imagine you have, have focus group or, or even an interview with someone takes 30 or 40 minutes. How do you make sense of this interview if you conduct, let's say, seven interviews in a row and you want to make sense of the data? Um, <clears throat> So these are called primary data collection. Primary because you conduct the data yourself. You go, you design your interview, you design your question, you design your survey, you conduct the data or you, you oversee the, uh, the data collection. What are some advantages and disadvantages of this method of you going and conducting the data? And by you, I mean yourself or the team working with you or people you train, etc. Some of the advantages that it designed to address a specific problem or issue. You have a specific problem or issue, you want to address it, you go and conduct data and that specific problem, right? You have more control over the design of the study or the data collection. Accuracy, I put accuracy, but again, that depends on how accurate you are in, in the way you collect your data. So yes, accuracy is there, but also this is a very, um, depends depends on if you are ac accurately collecting the data or if you're using uh, accurate methods and so on. Uh, current information, because you have the problem, you go collect the data, you have the information of the time right now, what's happening now. But there are some disadvantages too. It can be costly and time consuming. Um, other thing, uh, it can, it, it might not be visible for all the other reasons such as cost time, but also um, maybe the community you're trying to reach is not, uh, you can't reach this community for a specific reason or a specific time. Maybe people are uh, busy with uh, harvesting at that time when you wanted to conduct data, for example, and so on. There are many reasons for it to be uh, not visible. And skills, you need skilled people. You need the skills in, 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 in the way that um, people are trained and skilled in, co uh, in conducting, let's say, focus group interviews. You need facilitators. Some people are trained to be facilitators in that, to just collect the uh, focus group interviews. Or um, you need the skills to design a survey. And so the, the, you, you have to have the right skills. Um, but also I want to emphasize the importance of informal feedback. We've talked about you design a specific type of question, questionnaire, survey, uh, interviews, but also you get informal feedback and these are important. You have phone logs. Let's say you're receiving uh, calls every time in your specific office uh, about a problem, a concern, and now we say, uh, phone logs, it could be uh, social media information, for example, if you have Facebook page or something, you're receiving a common type of question and you see a theme coming, emerging. You, that, 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 that's um, a hint to look deeper in, in, into that. And maybe conversation after 
after a specific program, this type of conversation, like I learned this or uh, this is important. I don't, all this information should be recorded somewhere and looked at. Um, maybe what are other people doing around you in the, in the same area of profession? And uh, more importantly, why these things are being done. So if we talk about needs assessment, and here where I'll um, emphasize a little bit on why do I use the term needs assessment and community assessment. If we talk about needs assessment, we are looking at problems, needs, issues, concern, what's, what are the troubles in this community, right? So we're looking at, we have a specific community and we're looking at drug problems, uh, drop out of school, uh, high school, for example, uh, maybe poverty, etc. These are the issues and concern when we are talking about needs assessment. And that if we look, we're looking at the half empty of the glass. The community is a little bit more, not a little bit, way more than just problems. So in every community, there are uh, strengths, skills, gift people are gifted in these communities we need to look at the indigenous knowledge many things and i'm i emphasize this i'm not saying that if you conduct only needs assessment looking at issues problems you're wrong you're fine you can conduct only needs assessment look at problems issues concern but i've been an advocate and along with my lod uh, team members for looking at the half full of the glass as well so as you conduct an assessment we would encourage looking at assets in the community as well. Because every community has assets, whether these assets are tangible, excuse me, whether these assets are tangible or intangible assets. So tangible assets can be um, a building in the community that can be used such as a library or a um, community center or anything. Uh, um, some assets that you can't really like the skills of people, you can't, um, you can't easily identify these, but they are available and they are important. The way you look at communities, the, the benefit of looking at the, um, the strength and the weakness of the community, you give the community the power of change. You're not addressing the community as just a problematic community. It's a community with its problems and assets and gifts and resources. So the community, when you give the community, the, the community, they know that they have assets and resources and skills, they can build on these skills. And it's always a good approach to, to, ha to mobilize the community. So this is more of a, a mobilization for the community to, to start solving the problems and their own problems. And, and uh, so I always advocate if you do, you can do, I'm not saying it's wrong, you can do needs assessment, just identify what problems, issues, concern, but it's important, I, am, I emphasize to address the assets, gifts and resources in the community because from within the community, you can solve some problems without heavily relying on external funds or, or, or aids and so on because you have assets within that community. And we don't have the time today to go into details on how to conduct this type of discussion, but um, uh, we will share uh, on our website uh, some resources and you can access these resources about how to conduct uh, an asset-based approach to needs assessment or a community assessment. So um, asset-based approach to needs assessment, uh, the advantages um, that you create rich data. Results are easy to understand uh, because it's not uh, numbers, graphs, percentages, and some of this kind of data might be a little bit um, challenging for some people to, to understand. Uh, community members have ownership of the process. I just talked about the ownership, that it's very important that the community take lead in, in, in the process. It focuses on the positive sides of the community. So you focus on the positive, trying to solve problems, uh, trying to solve uh, the negative things in the, in the community. 
Uh, the disadvantage is that qualitative data analysis might be a little bit challenging. Um, it's difficult to get to people, uh, change their mindset sometimes to think about the positive part. If the community has always been told or has always perceived themselves as problematic community, difficult community, problems community, it's very hard to change the mindset and look at the positive part. Uh, can be hard to find common time for meetings and so on. So um, with, with talking about that, we talk about um, when you develop an education program, what are some of the decisions you need to make? It's not only about the needs of the community or the assets in the community. There are many other things you need to consider, such as institutional mission. Uh, so is, is, is the problem you're addressing, uh, does that problem fit within the, the, the mission of, of uh, extension? Is it beyond the extension reach of, of um, either mission or resources? Um, you have to find an interest group. You might have pressure from, uh, let's say you're working in a specific county, you're funded uh, by this county. What are some pressure you might face on addressing some problems that might be uh, political or sensitive or so on. Um, the tradition and history of program. There are many areas you need to consider and look at as you develop your education program. So yes, you address needs and assets, but also you look at other aspects. Does anyone have a question so far or am I going very fast? All right. Um, so um, what you need to consider when you determine a program priority? So the factors you need to consider are visible, reachable, and can be visibly influenced by the organization. As I just said, um, I'm trying to think, can someone give me an example of something might be an issue, but it's out of the reach of OSU extension to address. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> it seems like we try to solve the problems for everyone. <laughs> but there must be something that, that is beyond the reach of, uh, of, of extension. I don't know. I can't think of one on top of my head now. But, um, but anything that's outside of the mission of extension and it's beyond our reach, then we have to think carefully of what we address, right? Um, and the resources also available. Maybe, yes, you have certain problem in the community, but always, um, if you don't have resources, maybe look around you. There, there are other, uh, that's why I say assets. Assets can be another organization in your own community that's working on solving that specific problem, but with collaboration, then you make more, uh, more, more powerful program if you collaborate with other organizations. So you don't have to always be. So that's when you look at your stakeholders, partners, and building partnerships within your community. That's the resources you have. Um, and then the problem has to be, of course, a great concern or critical uh, uh, to a critical mass of the community. And that's also, I mean, it, it, it can be also for minority, but it also it's a great concern, right? So um, here is a kind of way to prioritize your, your problems, uh, your, sorry, your programs. If the program has high impact and low effort, that's definitely a program you need to go for. Uh, if people can share in the chat box or just open their uh, mic and share example of programs they do in their communities that are high impact but low effort. Any thoughts, ideas? It's difficult to find a program with high impact and low effort, I guess.
have a very tight group today. I was going to say the successful co-parenting online version. Mm -hmm. Yes, because that's, um, that's a version that's kind of, maybe there was effort put behind it, but it's ready now already and it's being delivered. So when it comes to the delivery, there was effort at the design stage, I would expect, for example. But now at this point, you have, you reach to as many people as they need the program, and then you have high impact from that program. Thank you. What can be a high impact and high effort? I remember when we um, did this session, uh, some people shared, yeah, I see something in the chat box. Yeah. Real money, real world, 4-H camps. Yes, I was going to say the 4-H camp. FNAP, SNAP, Ed programs. Master gardening. Dining with diabetes. Yeah, you have high impact and high effort in this type of programs. What can be a low impact and high effort? And these are the type of programs you need to avoid. You're putting a lot of energy, effort, resources, time, but there is very low impact. These are the type of programs you need to avoid. Be low impact, low effort. Any ideas? I would think of any program that consumes, um, okay. I have had a few that I have to put a lot of time into and had no or few participants. Mm -hmm. So probably either the participants might not be interested, so it's not a, a concern for the community or for the, for, for the population you're addressing maybe, so that makes it a lot of uh, effort, but then low impact. And then also you have low impact, low effort programs. So those are kind of programs is like in between, right? You, you have low impact, but you put low effort as well. So always go for high impact, low effort. This, of course, this is the priority of the programs you can go for. Um, with that, do you have any questions for me? Um, we'll pass the mic <laughs> to Brian, but if you have questions, just feel free to ask me or maybe you can ask me after Brian's presentation. Uh, I will remind you that uh, tomorrow we have uh, Debbie and T talking about some of these um, data collection methods that I just highlighted. Uh, we'll have uh, on Wednesday uh, methods of data analysis for qualitative, how to make sense of all these words. And uh, we'll share the schedule with you for the rest of the week. Um, so Brian, go ahead. All right, sounds good. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and leave a few minutes at the end of this hour if anybody has any questions to come up for Amy, so. All right, let's go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. All right, everybody.
So I'm going to spend about half an hour or so talking about secondary data, um, as Amy covered primary data just a bit ago. Um, it's kind of funny because secondary data, I think, is what you actually look at first. Um, so I think before, as a general rule, before you get to surveys and focus groups and discussion groups and NGTs and those kind of things, um, doing a quick perusal, a quick search for secondary data, data that's already out there might be a good step to take. Um, so yeah, in a way we kind of did this backwards, but, um, but it's good. All right, so real briefly, I'm gonna talk about what secondary data is, um, much like Amy, what are the advantages and disadvantages? I'll talk about a real brief um, example of what we've done in the last couple of years with one of our programs. And then um, I just picked seven different sources of secondary data, seven different places to look. There are of course dozens, if not hundreds of places to look for secondary data. Um, to give you some information on your community, but I just picked seven that I like or that I use or that are, I think are most useful to folks in extension. All right, so quite simply, secondary data refers to data that was gathered by somebody else. Um, basically, it was done for a different purpose, for a different reason than what you're doing, um, but it can be used, borrowed, shaped um, to meet your needs um, for your community, for your project, for your issue, whatever it is. So advantages of that process are, of course, um, it gives you a really quick, really first approximation of your community. So it might be uh, a report done by somebody else. It might be a spreadsheet of data. Um, it might be an infographic. Um, but in a really short amount of time, you can get a real quick approximation of what's happening in your community. It can also help um, you to make decisions very quickly. Um, interviews, surveys, focus groups, analysis of that data, that, that takes a long time, as Amy pointed out. Um, you know, you can download a data set from the census and you can get a really quick um, decision made based on, on that information. Uh, it's a really great resource for grant writing. Um, so we're, we're talking a lot about needs assessment, um, asset assessment, and those kind of things, but a lot of these tools are also used in sort of the grant writing process, and a lot of you do write grants. So a lot of what I'll talk about today is good data sources for, um, for grant writing. And finally, and super key here, is that it's cost effective. Um, pretty much every, everything I'm going to show you today is free. Um, it's already been done, already paid for by somebody else. Um, so you can get the benefits of that by basically using what's already been done for free, other than your time. Disadvantages, um, there was obviously a lack of control of, their, of how, how the, the data was gathered. So you can't dictate you know, for how long and how many samples and how many people and all that kind of stuff. You have to just kind of go with what was already collected. You might find limited units or limited categories, for example. So you know, let's say you wanna have your data sorted out by congressional district and it's only available by zip code. Um, or you, wanna, you want data for 11 and 12 year olds, and there's only data for 13 and 14 year olds. Um, so sometimes you're limited in what you can get. The accuracy is of course unknown because you didn't do it yourself. Um, you know, most of who is doing this um, are highly skilled, highly trained people um, sticking to methodologies and protocols that are pretty, um, pretty robust. And so you can have faith that it's accurate data, but you never quite know. Uh, you also might find some outdated data. So this stuff does take a while to do. So you might find data from 2015, 2017, 2018, 2010. Um, and but that might be the best that we have. And then finally, um, not too much of this today, but you might have some access issues. So a lot of these data sets could be uh, collected by third parties or places you have to pay money or be a special member to get access to. But I will steer clear of those today and just give you some free stuff. All right, so real quick, who, who are we gonna look at today? Um, the census, of course, probably our number one go-to for secondary data. They have it all. We're gonna look at the county health rankings that I'm sure many of you have seen done by uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We're gonna look at some completed needs assessments, one that have already been done for your community. Um, I think in extension, we have a big desire to go out and just do stuff um, without maybe pausing to see if it's already been done. Uh, a lot of you are part of your local, local boards and advisory committees and uh, United you know, Ways and are aware of this stuff happening, but it's always a good place to look. 
Uh, we're also going to look at some CHAs or community health assessments. These are often done at the local level by health departments and other, um, other committees. Uh, next, we're going to look at two surveillance systems. So uh, full disclosure, I'm a public health surveillance guy um, in a past life. So I, um, I love these systems and they provide a lot of great information. So we're going to look at the behavioral risk factor system as well as the youth risk factor system. And then finally, number seven, I put in kind of a new one for me anyway. Um, Feeding America has a mind the meal gap that talks a lot about things like food, food security, which a lot of us are working in nowadays. All right, so with that, let's get out of here. So, you know, a real quick example I wanted to show um, was, you know what, I'm gonna hold that till the end. I'm gonna get into the data first because we're already at 133. Um, but my example from, um, from Celebrate Your Plate, I'll talk about that at the end if I have time. All right, so number one on my seven sources is the census. Um, so many of you have probably used this, uh, but it is just a treasure trove of data um, on many levels, state, county, zip code, census group, block group, um, gets down to street level if you want to that, that, that far down. Um, but it is a great way to get data on your communities. Um, it's been revamped. So if you haven't been here lately, the website is data.census.gov. Um, I think most of us think of census data as stuff like demographics um, for, for people and households. And that is where a lot of the power in it lies. Um, there is a lot of information about uh, race, ethnicity, age, gender, uh, family size, all that kind of stuff. Um, but really there, I mean, there's, um, there are categories that you're not aware of. There are categories that get really specific. Um, and so there's a lot of economic data. There's a lot of job data. There's a lot of household characteristic data um, and, and those kind of things. And so if you have kind of thought about it only as a way to kind of see what your racial breakdown is for your county um, or your or zip code or whatever, I would you know, really encourage you to get into it because um, there is um, a lot to dive into. The other great thing is that it is very, very scalable. Um, and that's its genius, I think, in that if you want to sort of create, if you want to pull up like a, a pre-made report for your county, um, which is basic summarized information, you can do that in a matter of minutes. Um, all the way up to, if you're somebody who really likes data and likes manipulating data, you can export um, just enormous data sets, <laughs> uh, tens of thousands of fields, um, and you can play with that data in whatever way that you see fit and reconfigure categories and do all kinds of fun stuff with it. So it really is, uh, it really runs the gamut of whoever, what, how, much, you know, how much time do you have, who are you, what are your skills, what are your interests, um, and it appeals to many, many people. Um, so normally I would sit here and I would kind of show you how to use it, but we've already done that. So if you have not seen this, um, LOD a few months back, uh, we created a seven minute video on how to use the census uh, website. And that is found on our LOD website um, under the program and product development uh, in the assessment section. And it's a YouTube video that you can also find on our LOD YouTube page. Um, it is narrated by Danae Wolf. And Danae takes you step by step through the census website and tells you how to find information on your communities. And it is fabulous. So, um, so I'm not going to spend the time right now to go, to go through it. Uh, you can go and watch Danae's video and she covers it very, very well. So, all right. So that's the census. Um, I want to move on to my next kind of category and that is um, the RWJF county health rankings and roadmaps. Um, I'm sure many of you have gone here before, but it is awesome. Um, they've been doing this now for a little while. And essentially what um, this website has done is it has taking, taken many, many, many um, health factors and combined them into single scores for counties in order to sort of rank or to look at where counties are in different health indicators. So there are two main categories to look at. One is health outcomes. And health outcomes basically, um, they're combining like 
sort of the overall quality of life and the overall length of life um, in that county. And they're getting data on those, on those, on those metrics and they're combining them together to sort of get an overall health outcome rank. Um, and the other one is um, health factors. This one's a bit more, uh, a bit more, uh, uh, has a bit more depth to it. So health factors, they're including things like um, health behaviors. So things that we do as people to, uh, to increase our health benefits or our health risks. Uh, clinical care. So what does the, sort of the clinical care system look like in that county? We also look at social factors, economic factors, um, the physical environment. So are there opportunities for exercise and walking and that kind of stuff as well. And they're rolling all those things up into a single score for a county. So um, yeah, so you can look at these things, um, click on, let's see, let's see, Henry County. So Henry County ranks um, 11th, uh, looks like overall. Um, and you can really get into their, um, the broken down data set. So for example, here's Henry County, here are their health factors, um, looks like 17% of folks in that county are smokers. The obesity rate is at 33%, um, and they have all kinds of other things, teen birth rates, um, physical activity, drinking. So if you're interested in overall health, or if you're interested in these specific sort of health topics, um, this is a great place to start. So for example, if you are writing a grant, um, yeah, a grant to work on limiting um, alcohol impaired driving deaths, in Henry County. You can go to this website, find out what the current rate is. Um, you can even look at trends over time. So what has happened to that, um, to that data over time? And you can talk about the need for your program in this county to, in order to, um, to reverse a current trend or something along those lines. So county health rankings, fantastic. Um, you could spend hours and hours and hours in here playing around because um, there is a lot to look at. Um, so yeah. On the back end, this is their measures. So I mentioned that they take a lot of different data sets, a lot of different measures and combine them into, to, to kind of make one score. On the measures pages, you can find out what they used to calculate that score. And this is kind of like a behind the curtains look at all the data sets that they went and they got to create these scores. And a lot of these data sets I'll be talking about here in the next few minutes. Um, but it's great. They're very, very good um, at getting all of the, at the most up-to-date data possible. So you can see we've got surveillance systems. Um, they have access to things that you want to have access to, but um, that's why they did the work. So um, census surveys, um, business data, public health data, drinking water data, all kinds of great stuff. So again, this is to say that um, if you're looking at doing these kinds of things in your community, by all means, go for it. But a lot of the work has already been done by great folks like um, RWJF Foundation. Okay, number three, um, my, kind of my third suggestion is to look at existing needs assessments that have already been done in your county or in your community. Um, and again, UW, you know, the way does a lot of these because they kind of have to. Um, and they do these with coalitions in their counties. And you've been part of um, some of these perhaps. So these are usually great. Um, they're usually really well done, and they usually are a wonderful cross, uh, cross-cutting snapshot of what's happening in that county. So I did kind of a random search, and I found Delaware counties, um, which is where I live. So I'm particularly interested in this. Um, again, this is five years old, which isn't bad. Um, I'd say it's getting toward the end of its usable life, but maybe they're working on a new one already. Um, so yeah, so what you find in these, um, you tend to find the process of how they did these things. And a lot of this is what Amy talked about. So the process that Delaware took was that they looked at existing data, which is what we're talking about right now. Uh, step two, they went and they got data uh, and they got feedback from kind of their existing partners, which we're very good in extension. We're very good at asking our 4-H families and we're good at asking local businesses that work, work with CD um, about information. Um, and so they did that as well. And then their third step, which again falls right into Amy talked about, was to engage key audiences in small group conversations. So they took those three steps, they thought that was great, um, and they 
took all the information, all that data, and they analyzed it and they summarized it and they got some key things. So this, this document itself is almost 60 pages long, um, but they boiled down all their work into five key, key findings. So opiate abuse, um, mental health services, food insecurity, families in crisis, and mentorship opportunities were the five areas that Delaware County identified um, as needing focus and needing maybe some resources and some capacity building. So again, if you are in a local community um, looking for a way to affect change or write a grant or create a program, this is where I would start. I would say, oh, wait a minute. There's a big need in Delaware County for work on food insecurity. Um, I have some ideas or I have some energy or I have some money around that and I wanna, I wanna be a part of that. So, and again, this has already been done. This is not, there's no need for you to go out and do this. Um, you can obviously work with, with local partners to do more focus work in any of these areas, but for the most part, it's already been done. Um, and again, this document is great. It goes on, it's got tables, it's got graphs, it's got charts, it's got all kinds of wonderful, um, wonderful stuff. Um, I also went over to Hancock County. Again, I guess a caveat here <laughs> is that um, a lot of this really good, really big work is being done in counties that have resources <laughs> for the most part. Um, so your big health departments, your big you know, United Ways, your big food banks, um, those things tend to be housed in, um, in urban, more urban areas, but not necessarily. Um, so you might find a lot of the resources in those kinds of places, but there are definitely things happening and you, you all know this as well um, in smaller counties and in more rural counties. So I went over to Hancock County's uh, page for their United Way and they have a community reports section, which is amazing. Um, and here they have listed about 10 or a dozen different reports um, about th th that they've done over the years um, about Hancock County. So if I worked in Hancock County, I, I, would, I would probably know this page up and down um, to really kind of get a sense of what the community needs are and what the assets are. All right, next, um, CHAs. So these are near and dear to my heart. I used to work on these a lot. Um, so community health assessments, my number four kind of tip. These are obviously health focused, um, as the name implies, but there is a lot of good um, demographic data in these. Um, and as we expand our definition of health and what affects health, you're also gonna find a lot of information in these things about things like um, income and um, social determinants of health and um, access and physical activity, uh, physical barriers, the physical environment. Um, and so it's not just like how many folks have diabetes in the county. Um, it really is a, a comprehensive document of, of a comprehensive look of, of health. So Cuyahoga County, this is from a couple of years ago. Um, and this one is massive, 300 pages almost, tons of partners, incredible effort to collect data. Um, so even if you don't live in this county and you don't, um, you don't uh, find this all that useful, it's great to kind of look at, at their methods and it's great to look at how they did this and what they looked at if you're thinking about doing this in your local community. So for example, this report has things like demographics, hospital patients, uh, socioeconomic indicators, uh, quality of life analysis, some of the behavioral factors, um, environmental stuff, mental health, uh, MCH, death and illness. Um, so again, it goes way beyond what you might think of as health. Um, and it talks about all these different factors that are super useful. Um, so again, not to get too far into this report, because again, it is, um, it's maybe the most comprehensive county report that I've seen in a long time. Um, you know, to look at the priorities, right? So, um, you know, their number one takeaway was a discussion on poverty um, and how health status is dictated by poverty in the county. Uh, and then here are, you know, priority health and safety concerns for Cuyahoga County. So cardiovascular disease, suicide rate, infant mortality, high blood lead levels, um, opioid deaths, flu vaccinations, tobacco. So right there, there's a top seven or eight um, that are so diverse and could be a, you know, any number of entry points for extension programming. Um, so yeah, so CHAs, definitely take a look at those um, and they will, um, they will help. 
All right, what else? Uh, I'll have a couple more actually. So again, Cuyahoga, again, it's, it's, it's really big and really good. Here are Summit Counties from last year. Um, this one's tremendous. I like this one a lot. Um, structured very much the same. Here are their priority areas, chronic disease, adolescent health, aging, and uh, maternal infant health, um, and mental health and addiction. So again, similar ideas, similar, um, similar steps taken to put this together. But um, there's a good chance that you have a decent health department um, in your community or in your area or in your region. They might have done some of this work. Um, and again, here's Hancock counties. Um, this one's great. Hancock County, not a huge county, not a ton of resources. Um, but this is a really nice, um, a really nice one. Again, not as fancy, not as flashy, but the data is there um, and the priorities are all there. So table of contents for this one looks very much like, uh, like the others. But again, cancer, diabetes, drug use, women's health. Um, again, just pages and pages of data about these kinds of things from this community. All right, so moving on. Let's talk about Burfus. Um, so Burfus is a surveillance system that the CDC runs. And basically they um, contact people, tens of thousands of people every year randomly and ask them about their, their, their behaviors. So things like, do you smoke? And do you exercise? And all that kind of stuff. And um, as we've seen, a lot of that Burfus data ends up in things like the, the county health rankings and it ends up in things like CHAs. So a lot of that work is already being absorbed into bigger reports. But if you're a person who really is interested in specific behaviors, um, you can get into this data in order to kind of get a bit, maybe a bit more detail. Um, so there is, every state has an office basically. So ODH has a purpose office where they have coordinators who coordinate all this data um, and they can be contacted and you can ask them for some help if you would like, maybe not now, um, they're kind of busy with other things um, health related, but uh, soon I'm sure you could reach out to ODH and ask about purpose data. But a lot of counties um, have already kind of done that. So I went and I found, um, here is ODH's 2017 uh, annual report on their purpose data. And it's great, it's a summary of behavioral uh, risk factor data for the state of Ohio. And just if you're curious, here's their table of contents. Again, everything from chronic disease to things like sugar-sweetened beverages, um, e-cigarettes, um, seatbelt use. Um, so these are all questions that we ask people and we get answers. Um, and they're all summarized in tables. Um, so key findings, um, here's an indicator of declining health status um, by household income. So essentially, um, the less income your family has, the higher your chances are of having, or the higher the reported um, re reportings of, of, of fair or poor health by people on the survey. So again, a treasure trove of health-related data for the state of Ohio, um, and it is very, uh, very interesting. All right, number six is kind of the youth version of that. Um, so the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System, or YERBS, um, this is asking uh, youth things about um, sexual behaviors, tobacco use, drug use, alcohol use, um, dietary behaviors, all these kind of things. So if you're involved in youth work, 4-H or otherwise, um, there is a lot of great data in this surveillance system about youth. Um, a sample of kids across the state take this every year you know, in schools. Um, I believe um, it's almost all high school, um, but there is a, sort of an emerging uh, uh, sort of number of surveys being given to middle school kids as well. Um, and so again, a lot of data here about youth behaviors um, and a lot of counties have already done work uh, summarizing this for you. So again, the kind folks at Summit County um, have put together a, um, a brief on their YERBS data from 2013 and 2018. So very cool. So they got a hold of this data um, and they have summarized it into a four page document. So if you live in Summit County and you work with youth and you have not seen this, I recommend checking it out. Um, so it talks about um, all of the specific things that are asked on the data, on the, on the survey. 
um, and it summarizes it really nicely. So um, obesity increases um, in high school students um, from 2013 to 2018. Um, and a lot of other great, great stuff, great infographics, drug use amongst teens, how that's changed from 2013 to 2018. It's a real nice table um, of how it looks like it's decreased in a lot of different ways. Um, so again, a really nice snapshot that's already been done. It took me about 30 seconds to find this report and, um, and I've got a lot of great data on teens in Summit County. All right, so number seven. Um, this is kind of a new one for me, but um, I stumbled upon it recently. Many of you in this training have probably used this more than me, but um, a lot of work recently and definitely for the future in food security and food insecurity. Um, and so how do you measure that? How do you quantify that? Um, how does it differ from county to county? How does it differ from, um, from food bank to food bank. And so um, Feeding America has done that work um, in their project, which they're entitled, uh, have titled Mind, uh, Map the Meal Gap. Um, and so you can really get into their map and you can look at specific counties and you can look at their food insecurity rates and you can kind of find out what that means. Um, so here's Marion County, um, food insecurity rate of 14.6%, um, average meal costs, um, and a lot of really good data about, um, about food, about, um, about income, about access to food um, in Ohio's counties. Um, and the map is great, but it also comes with a, um, a table. So here's a table of 2017 data for every county. Um, so population, food insecurity rate, basically the, the number of food insecure persons um, that have been estimated for that county um, and some other, other great data. So, really powerful information if you're looking to do work in this area um, or write a grant to address these things so all right and with that we are at 154 um, so again that is um, a really brief look at secondary data um, and i called it an analysis but it's not it's not really um, i'd say there's if you want to do analysis by all means go to analysis um, but for the most part, I would say that one can do, um, it's really just kind of a search. It's like a walkthrough. Um, it, is, um, it is just a kind of an exploration, I think, of what's out there. And um, if you want to analyze stuff, then you can go ahead and analyze stuff. Um, but yeah, for the most part, um, it is really, um, it's really work that's been done by people that are smarter than me um, that is there for you to be used. So uh, communities do this work to, to be able to, to share it and for folks to use. And again, my talk just now was very focused on health and public health and those kind of things. But um, again, the census has a lot of information um, and I'm sure others in extension, um, ag folks, perhaps CD folks, definitely. Um, can maybe point us in different directions um, to things like economic data sets and workforce data sets and those kind of things as well. So with that, let's open it up to um, any questions for Amy or myself. And if there are none, I'm going to try and um, pull up some, my example I was going to share earlier. Debbie is, oh, thanks, Debbie. So definitely check the, um, check the chat. Debbie's got some links to our website. All right, all right, I guess I'll share if people are still on. Um, let's see, most of you are still here. Right? Okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. So here's a good example of actual analysis. Um, so again, Celebrate Your Plate. Um, if you're not aware of it, it is the social marketing campaign for SnapEd um, in conjunction with a bunch of statewide partners like WIC 
and ODH and ODE and a bunch of our friends. Um, basically, we are taking some SNAP ed social marketing dollars and we are spending those dollars in communities in Ohio in order to encourage folks to eat more fruits and vegetables. So we did a lot of um, we did a lot. We, 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 we put posters up in, in grocery stores and convenience stores. We paid for um, uh, advertisements on Pandora radio and ads for um, at pop ups. Um, we spent money um, in a few different places. But the key being that because it's a it's a it's a USDA NIFA snap ed project, we can only spend money in low income communities. And we had to find essentially low income communities in Ohio. Not, not, not just low income, but communities where um, there were households with children in them that were at or below 185% of the poverty level. And in those communities where there were a high percentage of those families, we were able to go in and spend dollars to get those folks to improve their diets, hopefully. Um, so that was the task. Um, so first thing we did was we looked at the census data and we basically exported it. I think this is an old spreadsheet, but it is okay so um the point is we exported the data from um from the census by census tract um, census tract is a pretty small area of land that holds about on average ten thousand people and we looked at those communities we looked at all the households in those communities that had kids and we we found out what percentage of those uh, households were at 185 percent or below the poverty level um, in all the counties in Ohio. So there are thousands of census tracts in Ohio. Um, and so we were able to zoom in on the ones where there was a higher prevalence of, um, of poverty in families. And so on the screen right here is an example of just a, a snapshot. So Clinton County, Dark County, um, Fayette County. So these are, these are census tracts within these counties that have a high percentage of, um, of low income families. And then we took those census tracts and we just, we found out using mapping stuff, um, ArcGIS technology, we found out what zip codes those, um, those tracks were in. And then we were able to say to, um, to our marketing company, hey, just spend money in these zip codes and no other zip codes. And so we basically spent money in these low income zip codes based on all this analysis. So, yeah, this took a while, um, but it was a way to um, to completely and accurately assure um, the funders um, that we were spending money in good places. So in places that needed it and we got our sort of most bang for the buck. So again, that was a lot of analysis that you could do um, if you were interested in exporting uh, raw data from the census. All right. <clears throat> All right, so with that, um, thanks so much, right, Amy? That was great. Uh, this is stuff thanks. that we like doing a lot. So yeah, if you have any, again, if you have any questions or needs, please reach out to us. Um, if you have any suggestions for data sets or other secondary data sources, I would love to, um, to see them. I'm always kind of expanding what we have access to um, that I'm not familiar with, so. So yeah, with that, we will see you all tomorrow. Teresa and uh, and Debbie will be covering some great stuff tomorrow. So hope to see you all then. All right, thank you.